Grace, peace, and mercy be unto you from the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. So our text for this morning comes from our gospel reading from John chapter 4 and this idea of living waters, this spring that's being planted inside of us that will well up, as Jesus says, into life eternal. If you've never been around a natural spring, it's an amazing thing to see. If you, if you find one that you just happen upon, you'll see the water bubbling out of the ground. Where I come from, it's not uncommon for people to look for them. I think some people still divine, but I've never done that. But we do look for them, and I know in a couple of times when I was a young boy, uh, my dad was looking for springs on the property to have water to feed the cattle. And so we would find them, and you would kind of dig a couple of holes in the ground, and you would see this water start to just come forth out of the ground. It would bubble up. Once they had found these, they would uh, come in with uh, equipment and dig out a place so the water would have a place to collect and so that the animals could feed. We did have one that was a natural source that uh, was on some property we had. We didn't have to dig. It was there. Uh, but my daddy showed me how to... Uh, do some things to keep it so it wasn't, uh, if you will, uh, contaminated. There's a way to keep the water to drain off so that it fills another spot, doesn't contaminate the actual spring. But this idea of living waters is not new to us as Christians. When we come into this world, we are born into this world, dead in sin, separated from our God our Father because of original sin. And we don't have this living water in us, this faith. So then through the hearing of the gospel message and through the working of the Holy Spirit, our hearts are convicted, we're converted, we stop refusing that gift that's been paid for us by the very body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as we understand from Scripture, the Holy Spirit places into us this faith, living waters as Jesus is referring to. It's placed into us and we get 100%. God doesn't say, come, I'll give you 25% today and I give you 50% when you get older or something along that line. We get it all. Our problem is, is we don't trust in it. We don't always have confidence in it. Yet Jesus tells us if we have faith even as strong as a small mustard seed, which is teeny tiny, we can make mountains move into the sea and trees be uprooted and so forth. Water is important. We look at the reading from Exodus, the uh, Israelites are out in the wilderness, and once again they're complaining to Moses because they're thirsty. Fourteen times they complain to Moses about him dragging them out into the wilderness to die of thirst and to be overrun by the armies or whatever it is they're complaining about, no mead. And yet they saw all, each time and time again, they saw the mighty works of God and how he took care of them and how he provided for them, and yet they still complained. So through Moses, once again, he provides that water so that they won't be thirsty. Our epistle reading is very prevalent to what's going on. We have this Samaritan woman at the well, and Jesus is telling her that he can give her living water so she will never thirst again, and that got her attention. Why? Because I don't have to come to the well anymore. I don't have to drag these urns or pots or buckets or whatever she's carrying the water in. She doesn't have to come out and try to get that and take it back to the village where she lives. It's a physical chore. So who wouldn't want everlasting living water, something you don't have to come back for? She misunderstood what he was saying, obviously. But it was important to her on a deeper level, too, because she was an outcast. The typical thing in society was is that the women would go to the well together from the village. It was a time for fellowship, to catch up on what's going on in the community. And yet she's here by herself. So for whatever reason, she's an outcast. She doesn't belong with the inner circle of the women. And so Jesus understands that. And so it's something even deeper for her and should be deeper for us is that we are outcasts in the world first as sinners, but then as Christians, the sinful world doesn't want us wants nothing to do with us. And it's this faith, this gift of living waters that wells up within us that brings us together of like mind and like faith together as we do this morning to worship, to receive the gifts of Holy Communion and do the other things that we do. We don't do it on our own. We have no motivation to serve God outside of the work of the Holy Spirit in us. 
thing that I take away from this and I want you to take away from this is this welling up of waters to eternal life is an ongoing process. Now I know that children will understand and those of us who can think back that far for some of us, uh, balloons are interesting things. You can fill them up with air and they'll inflate. You can fill them up with helium, they'll inflate and they'll float. You can also fill them up with water, can you not? different purpose in mind but at some point if you continue to place our sand you can put sand in the balloons it doesn't have to be liquid or air or gas but at some point if you continue to pour into this receptacle it will burst it'll stretch it'll give but it has a point in which it will no longer be elastic it stops and it explodes and that's what Jesus wants us to understand about this idea of faith, these living waters in us. He has put this into us, and it's not something to be stagnant. It's not something to cap. It's not something to ignore. It's something that should be building inside of us to a point where we want to share. We want to tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. When I was a kid, I don't know if they still have them, there were these rockets you could buy and you would put water into them, and there was a pump, and you could pump it up with air, and at some point it would do the same thing as the balloon. It wouldn't explode, but the air pressure would have it separate, and then it would lift off and spew water everywhere. That's what this idea about faith is. Unfortunately, as human beings, we live in a world that is broken. It's sinful. We know this, and that affects how we deal with our faith. Does it not? On a daily basis. Something tragic happens, and now you're not focused on the faith anymore. You're not focused on your relationship to Christ. You're focused on this terrible thing, and how do I fix it? And there's the first problem. How do I fix it? And we ignore it. Some people ignore it to the point to where it dries up, and it's not there anymore. It does happen. It reminds me of the TV sitcom, The Beverly Hillbillies, I used to watch as a kid. Uh, you know, they gained their... Uh, prosperity, their richness off of uh, oil that was coming out of the ground after he shot at the rabbit or whatever. And they plugged that hole. And there was an episode where something happened. Somebody went to move the plug for some reason, and there was no oil coming out. It was empty. It was just a hole in the ground. I don't remember what the details were. I think somebody had drilled in from the side and take, tried to take their oil, and they fixed all that. But the point is, it's something that needs to be fed, not in the sense that we feed our faith and therefore it's active and, and, and does what it does. We feed it in the fact that we need to get in touch with God. So in worship, we feed our faith. We hear the promises of God. We hear his word, and it reassures us that he is real. He is who he is. He cares for us, loves us, even though sinners we are. We study his word in Bible study to learn how to understand who we are as Christians and how we apply these teachings to our lives on a daily basis. And it continues to well up in us. We want more. We're not thirsty because we need to drink. We're thirsty because we want more. We want a closer, a deeper, richer relationship with Jesus Christ, the one who lived, suffered, died, and rose for our sins. And it just keeps boiling up and keeps boiling up. We don't want to not focus on it. We don't want to take attention away from it. We don't want to deprive it of what it needs, which is a relationship with Christ. We want to feed it. You've heard me say this. It's an analogy I use, and I think it's a good analogy. When I was a kid and my mama was making a cake, never made a chocolate cake because we hated chocolate. And I loved her for that. But whenever she made a cake, I would watch. I'd go up to the edge of the counter, and I'd watch her mix those ingredients together because the first time she did it, I learned that she saved me about a cup or a cup and a half of the dough, the batter. And that would not be a good thing by today's standards. We don't eat sugar. I do still, but... <laughs> But I was excited. Every time I knew she was making a cake, I would run to the kitchen, even when I was too tall or too short, excuse me, to not be able to quite see. I'd take my hands and I'd pull up as hard as I could so I could see over the edge. And I'm thinking, yep, any minute now, I'm going to get that spoon, I'm going to get those spatulas, and I'm going to get that cup of batter. I was excited. 
That's what it means to have these waters welling up inside of us. We are called to be excited. And it's interesting because if you look again at that epistle reading, it talks about we are to rejoice in our good things, our good times. No, our sufferings. We are to rejoice in our sufferings because suffering produces endurance Endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and the hope that is in Jesus Christ, our risen Savior, does not put us to shame. I love that verse because my daddy always used to tell me, this is good for you, it's building character. And maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But we need to be excited, not because we're hurting, not because we live in a broken world and things maybe aren't going the way we want them, but we're excited because we belong to the one true God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are privileged to be able to know Him on a personal basis, and we are privileged to have our name written in the book of life in heaven for all of eternity. We have a place prepared for us. And when it is all done in this world, and it will someday, that's where we're headed. And that's why we're excited. It's not because we don't love our family and we don't love our friends and we don't love where we're at. It's because going home is more exciting. Being with Jesus is more exciting than being in this sinful world. But until we leave this world, our excitement is to share that with anybody that will listen. Anybody. Matters not about gender or race or creed, or color, or whether they're a terrorist, or whether they're a serial killer, or whether they're an uh, embezzler, or whether they're the deacon of the church, or a pastor of another, it doesn't matter. We are to be excited to share. And when they say, we're not interested, I don't want to hear anymore, we pray for them, tell them God loves them, and we're excited to move on to the next person. And so when the things happen in life, and they do, cause us not to focus on our faith and not to focus on Christ again whether it's death, whether it's terminal illness, whether it's financial ruin loss of a job, relationship issues that's when we need to go to Christ the most he suffered for you everything that you've suffered in this world, he suffered as well, and he lived a sinless life, paid the price for you, took your sins upon himself all people's sins and died for you so that you can have eternal life. That's something to rejoice over. And that's something to be excited about. And so as Christians, we shouldn't be in church with the look on our face like we have to be here. And we shouldn't be singing hymns because we have to sing them. Or reading God's word because we have to read it. We should want to. We should want that living water and we should want it to be active in us and welling up because the time is short. Jesus is coming back. And the more excited we are, the more opportunities people have to hear the gospel message and we're being busy for our Lord. And there's not a bigger or better privilege than that. Jesus Christ came into the world lived, suffered, died, and rose again for you. And all he wants you to do is to love him, believe, but love him, and be excited about your relationship, excited enough to share that relationship with other people. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, guard your hopes and your faith, through your faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior.